Luke chapter 5. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, I, I wish that would happen. They want to hear from Jesus. That's not happening today. Even in a church. You go to church today and you hear phones ringing and rappers. And he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake. And the but the fishermen were going out of them and they were washing their nets. They weren't fishing. They were cleaning. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's. Now that was America. Get out of my boat. Call the cops. And prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now how's that for a church service? Well, that Simon is Peter. That's, yeah, that's Peter. He gets in the boat. Peter rolls him out. Only to head outboard engines. He sits in the boat. Uses the water as an acoustic system. And is preaching to the people. And when you go preach on the streets to people. Jesus wouldn't do that. Yes he would. Here it is. And when he had left speaking. It means when he's done. He said to Simon. Launch out into the deep. And let down your nets for the draft. And Simon answered and said unto him, Master, we look at look at Peter always fighting with God. Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down thy net. Why do you need to say that? <laughs> the Bible says in Matthew, for every idle word we shall speak. And you know what? We're like Peter. We got to give extra words to people that don't need to be spoken. And then we're going to do what, what we're going to be told to do. Name somebody wrong. And when they had this done, they <clears throat> enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. Well, that's, that's the problem. I'm going to say. He said let down the nets and they, they did half obedience. They let down a net. Or done that. And the net break. Had they let down the nets. I don't know how many. He said nets plural. The net would not have been broken. See Peter's already half in denial. Because you know we did it all night. Alright we'll do. We're only going to let one out. Too much trouble to let the other ones out. We've been working all night. And they beckoned unto their partners. Which were in the other ship. And they should come to help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. They're crying out for help to man. Jesus is standing right there. And don't tell me Peter doesn't know who he is. He's just been preaching to the people. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees and said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Now look at that. He knew who Jesus was. There's a sign to Peter. The, the, the miraculous fish. For he was astonished. And all that were with him. At the draft of the fishes. Which they had taken. And also. And so was James and John. The sons of Zebedee. Now look at that. Verse 7 says that Peter, Andrew, James and John. Were all partners. Now they weren't the same family. But they were of the same fishing class. Could have been cousins, true. I think I think the Bible would record it because it goes so far to say Zebedee, the father. It, I, I, could have, I'm not saying it's not, but to, but here they they here these four men of the twelve knew each other. And John and James, they're a particular group of disciples themselves. Peter, he's the, the ringleader of starting trouble. These four guys that Jesus picked right off the bat, it, 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 this is spice in the disciples. Then he's going to add a tax collector for a little chili power. Then he's going to add a man who's going to give himself into Satan. And a doctor who's a Gentile. Yep. 
So James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon, with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. So you got the emblem of a fish is supposed to be Jesus. And it says, some of them say Jesus. Did Jesus tell Peter he's going to go catch Jesus? All right, so he's going to go catch men. Do you go out and catch saved men? No. Go in all the world and preach to God. Do I go on the streets and say, hey, I want saved people to come here. I want saved people to believe on Jesus. No. Fish are a type of unsaved men of the reptilian class and the reptilian class that is represented or was represented in heaven is a fallen it is likened to a dragon a snake you gotta be careful you gotta know what you do before now I'll give a lot of credit at least somebody has something about Jesus in the back of their car I'll give them that much credit but you gotta know where it's coming from Give you credit for the fish in Jesus, but it'd be just better to drop the fish and just put Jesus. That's better than nothing. But fish are a type of unsaved men that the disciples are going to get. And as far as where we are right now, you don't see this anywhere else. They're unsaved Israelites. When we get to John, I think it's John. No, Luke. We're coming up pretty soon, Luke. We're going to read about. A man's gonna go get a sheep. Now, I'm gonna blow that portion out of scripture the Lord tarries from what is usually taught. Right now, fish. I don't like fish. And when they had brought the ships to land, they're out in the middle of the the sea. They forsook all and followed him. Now I wonder if all that fish supplied Zebedee with a living. We don't know why the father didn't go. I make mention that the father didn't go, but maybe health, maybe, I don't know. But there's a whole bunch of fish. Does God waste anything? No. Why were all these fish caught? I don't know the answer. <coughs> and it came to pass when he was in a certain city. What city? I don't know. But it's a certain city. You think this is a parable? Why is it there are some stories in the Bible that says a certain man, and then you turn around and say it's a parable? No, it's not. Jesus just didn't give a name. The Holy Spirit didn't tell us the name. So don't go be too quick to say, oh, it's a parable to back your religion. A certain man went and gathered. If it was a parable, it wouldn't give you such a certain man. A certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy. Not just feet and, and fingers. And I've seen pictures of face. Full. Who seeing Jesus fell on his face. And besought him saying Lord. If thou wilt. Thou canst make me clean. Remember. Leviticus 13.45. He's the cover under his left. Go unclean. Unclean. You can't come near me. I'm clean. And he says, Jesus, you can do it. I know you can do it. Whether you'll do it or not, I don't know. That's what he's saying there. And he's crying out that him, pass me not, O gentle Savior. But I know if you pass me by, I know you can do it, though. How's that for faith? And he put forth his hand and touched him. That was a no-no by law. The Bible says in, in Leviticus 13, 14, it says the priest was to examine him. It didn't say anything about touching him. And the law does say anybody who touches his saddle, touches his chair, touches him, is unclean. Well, you're not going to make Jesus unclean. And anybody in this crowd would have saw Jesus do this to this leprous man would be like, oh. See, take the Bible as a living example of life. These people just saw him touch someone who would scream, unclean. 
saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy departs from him. Now, Matthew 8 says it was cleansed. Now, here's a group of people. Here's his first disciples with him. He walks up to a leprous man. You can just imagine Peter. He touches him. Oh, my. He's, he's unclean. Wait a minute. We just had a reversal of life here. Instead of Jesus being unclean, the leprous man just became clean. That's against nature. Jesus did a, a reversal of life. The unclean man became clean, and you didn't harm Jesus Christ at all. So, <coughs> so you know what? I don't care how bad you are. I don't care how defiled you are. Jesus can touch you and make you clean. And you, you get some people, oh, I, I'm so filthy. God will never, no, you're never too filthy. The law forbade this man to have anything to do with anybody. The law said and he charged him to tell no man but go and show thyself to the priest and offer for thy cleansing according as Moses commanded for a testimony unto them there's the law go do what the law says because I haven't died I wasn't buried and rose from the grave again we're still under the law I want you to go back and tell those priests and freak them out see if they can find Leviticus 13 14 because that's never been open for a Jew as far as, okay, looking at you, yes, okay, you're defiled, you're unclean, you had leprosy. Wait a minute. You had leprosy, you ain't got it no more. Well, where's that part? What we got to do now? Never had that happen. But so much the more went there a fame abroad of him. And great multitudes came together to hear, to hear. And to, he, to be healed by him of their infirmity. So in the beginning of Luke, they're listening. They're wanting. By the end of the book of Luke, they're going to scream out, crucify him. He withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. You're going to find that a lot in Luke. Jesus prayed. So that means I don't need to pray in my life. Satan attacked Jesus. So Satan's never going to attack me in my life. Absolutely not. You break fact. If Jesus had to pray, you need to pray. If Satan's going to attack Jesus, oh, you better believe in the name of Jesus he's going to attack you. And probably get more victory than he got of Jesus. And it came to pass on a certain day. And he was teaching. That there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by. Chapter 2, verse 46. Which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold, men brought in a bed, a man which was taken with palsy. And they sought means to bring him in. And Mark 2 said there were four men. Delay him before him. Here's this guy's got pulses. He's on his bed. They're, they want to bring him to Jesus. Problem is, there's no standing room only. It's packed. When they could, when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude. Isn't this interesting? This is in Matthew nine, Mark two. Luke 5, this story of these four men and this, and this paralegic kind of pulsy kind of guy is in more times in the Gospels than the birth of Jesus Christ himself. Luke is the only one that records the birth and everybody makes a big deal about the birthday of Jesus, which is not December 25th. And here's a story of a man who, who has pulsy and it's found in three of the four Gospels. You know what that means? The story of this man is more important than the birthday of Jesus, and I don't know why it's so important. I haven't found that nugget yet. I'll tell you what I can get for this. There are people out there who can have more faith and help someone who doesn't have faith to Jesus.
That's one thing I can learn. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in, because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop and let him down through a tiling, the roof, with his couch unto the mist, into the mist before Jesus. So Jesus is in this house. He's talking. Next thing you know, here comes this bed floating down. When he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. Not, not the palsy. Thy sin. The wages of sin is death. What is the wages of sin doing for this guy? He hasn't died. The wages of sin brought this palsy. Sin brings illness. Sin brings disease. Sin brings death. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason. Now, Mark, we're only in Luke 5. Now that the Pharisees have already started their act. And the date, and I don't know about these dates. Someone knows more than I do. The date I see here is 31 AD. Now, if Jesus began to preach when he was supposed to preach by the calendar, he's only been preaching one year and they're already after him now. If the date, we don't know anything about the dates. But we know one thing for sure. It's not long. He just, he just went and got Peter, James, John, and Andrew. He hasn't even got the rest of the disciples yet. And the Pharisees are already now attacking him. Remember Satan said for a season? There's another season in Jesus' life. <clears throat> and the scribes and Pharisees began to reason. And just reading my notes here. And Ma Matthew 9 says within themselves. You know, when you have a controversy against somebody or God, and you're not saying it out loud, you're reasoning. Saying, who is this which speaketh blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus Christ. He just made it who he was right then and there. But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, be careful what you think. It's not just what you say. It's what you think. I think of the judgment seat of Christ. I'm not talking about lost people. I'm talking about saved people. I think the judgment seat of Christ, many Christians are going to be lost because they don't realize their thoughts are going to be judged. See, it's okay if I don't kill my boss, but I can think about it. That's not okay in the eyes of God. You know, it's okay. Uh, this is not me saying, okay? Because I, I, I know men out there, all right? I work with a lot of men. See, I've never stepped out on my wife, but I can think about those women in the in the, the cheerleaders. I can think about the women in those magazines. I can think about those women on the computer. I can think about those women on the TV. That I didn't do anything against my wife. And yet Jesus said in Matthew 5, Who shall look upon a woman that lust after in his heart has already committed adultery? We need to learn our thoughts will be judged. And our thoughts run away. And there's many thoughts I, I, I got to apologize. I just came out of a rotten job. And all the thoughts and dreams I used to have about that job. Man, the blood of Jesus was flowing. But it won't be at the judgment seat of Christ. The thoughts. He answered, said unto them. He answered them. They didn't say nothing. He answered them. Notice the words of the Bible. What reason ye in your thoughts? In your heart, excuse me. Not the head. Your thoughts come from your heart how's that so don't go to the psychiatrist he said but when jesus perceived their thoughts he answered and said unto them what reason ye in your hearts thoughts are not head it's your heart it's a heart condition so the first thing you want to realize as a sinner your sins come from your heart What's easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, rise up and walk? For me, neither. 
I could not go up to someone and say, hey, your sins are forgiven. No, absolutely not. I'd be a liar. I'd deserve hell. As some priests do say that. And I've had priests tell me as that as a little boy. Son, your sins be forgiven you. I've heard him say to a dog, your sins be forgiven you. Cash, check, or money. I've heard it. I can't say to somebody who's in a wheelchair, rise up and walk. Which is easier? None. Sorry. <laughs> There's some people I see, I love, I would, I would love to have this power. I'd love to go to the hospital behind me and set some people free. There's two events going on today and tomorrow. One person I don't even know, very serious surgery. I'd love to go up to them and be able to help them. But I can't. Do you realize the impact of that question you just asked these, these idiots? He gave them a question what they can't answer and what they can't do. But he can. And they know he can. But that they may know that the Son of Man has power on the earth to forgive sins. So who washes away my sins? The Son of Man. Who is the Son of Man? According to the Bible, it's Jesus Christ. It's not no priest. My wife knows him. My children know him. The Son of Man. No other. He said unto the sick of palsy. That's parentheses. That's a no. He's been talking to the Pharisees. Now he turns back to the man. Of I say unto thee, rise, take up thy couch, and go into thy house. <clears throat> Notice the sins were forgiven first, then the healing. And immediately he rose up before them. He didn't rise up, but he said, Sin, I sins be forgiven thee, verse 20. Immediately he rose up before them and took, took up that which he laid, the bed, and departed into his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen a strange thing today. The fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. Fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. That's what Jesus came to do. And after these things, he went forth and saw a publican named Levi. Now, here's the next disciple. The twelve are not even present again when the Pharisees start bad mouthing Jesus. Now he's going to add a little, little spice into the stew. He's got four fishermen. He's got the Pharisees now angry and now he's going to call a tax collector. Also known as Matthew. Which is also known as Matthew. This is also Matthew 9, Mark 2, Luke 5, more than the birth of Jesus Christ. The tax collector is mentioned more than the birth of Jesus and the birth of Jesus was taxation. Oh, ouch. You ever want to, you know, this, the Bible, you ever just want to see the behind the scenes that John says we couldn't write? These 11 men against this tax collector. And saw a publican named Levi, of all names, Levi. That was a priest class. Sitting at the receipt of custom, tax office. And he said unto him, follow me. He's walking by, he said, hey, follow me. And he let he he left all, rose up, and followed him. Now there are some people who will add to the story. He took his pencil and his paper, but the Bible says he left. He didn't write Matthew as he was as he was following Jesus. He left. He got off that table, and whatever he had on him, he he left, he left his table behind. That meant the money. I don't know if it was. If it, I don't know if it was just him sitting at the table by himself, but he left the money. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of public. Ooh, Peter would love that. Great company of publicans, not just one now, a whole entire staff. Matthew Levi called the IRS. He said, come on, let's have a big dinner. It's on me. And don't bring your receipts. I'll just, I want you to meet somebody. 
Wouldn't that be great in America if you were to have one big office like that and someone say, hey, I'm fighting Jesus here. I'm fighting a Bible-believing preacher. I want everybody to come and hear this man. <clears throat> Levi had made a great feast in his own house, and there was a great company of publicans and others that sat down with him. Ready? But the scribes and the Pharisees, there they are again, murmured against his disciples. Now it's against his disciples. Saying, why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? <clears throat> you see, you can't attack Jesus. Because Jesus, uh, verse 21 to 26, he nailed us hard. And we don't want that to happen again. So we'll go after his little defensive little disciples. You guys ought to know better to be sitting with those people. And Jesus answered, <laughs> Jesus answered, said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician. It's true. But they that are sick. So Jesus said, listen, if you're sick, go to a doctor. According to that verse there, we are sick. We need a doctor. We need to come to Jesus. He said, verse 20, Man, thy sins be forgiven thee. He had palsy. He needed a doctor. He needed a cure for his sins to relieve him of his disease. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. 19.10 They said unto him, Why do the disciples of John fast off and make prayers? And likewise the disciples of the Pharisees but they, but thine eat and drink. Uh oh, see this? The disciples of the Pharisees? The Pharisees have got people following them. Find that in the Old Testament. When did Nehemiah or Ezra have any followers? No, they followed God. And he said to them, Can ye make the children of the bridegroom fast? While the bridegroom is with them. Imagine having a, a, a bridal shower. And they're like, okay, where's the food? Where's the cake? Oh, there is no food. There is no cake. We're not going to have no food, no 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 cake, no nothing. It wouldn't be very nice. It wouldn't be very... But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them. Now he's beginning the show. He's not staying. When the bridegroom shall be taken away. That's not volunteer leaving. He's going to be dragged off. And he's talking to the Pharisees. And, those, and then shall they fast in those days. The book of Acts. The, la, the, the, the last night they were in the upper room. For fear of the Jews. He spake also a parable on them. No man puts a piece of new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new maketh a rent, and the piece that was taken out of the new agreeth not with the old. No man puts new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But the new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. No man also having drunk old wine straightway desireth new, for he saith, the old is better. So, we see Jesus now getting attacked. <clears throat> 